My name is Owen Woods. I'm the CTO of a services company called Indalva, about two and a half thousand people. I always joke with the biggest services company you'll never have heard of. Uh, this isn't about Indalva though. So uh, this is about productionization, which is very related to being rugged. Just to remind you, there's an app. You all know the story. Can you all rate the session in the app? Thank you. So what are we going to talk about? Um, first thing is, what is production? So a quick show of hands. Who here works for a startup? really small company. Anybody? No one. Who works for a company with an IT technology department of at least 200? Most people. Great. And how many of you work on a system uh, that's in production? Everybody. Great. So hopefully this will be relevant. Um, how many of you get called in the middle of the night if something goes wrong? That's a much smaller show of hands, I've got to say. You are on leading charmed lives. Um, this is mainly, this presentation is mainly about how not to get cold in the middle of the night. So hopefully uh, that might avoid it for those of you who do. So we'll just talk about what it is a production system is and what its characteristics are, because they're a bit different to the environment that most of us work in most of the time. And then briefly we'll just think about what is it actually goes wrong. But the main thing I want to talk about is the fact that there are four key requirements that I have noticed over many years every production system needs to exhibit. So we'll have a look at those. And then I found there's a pretty simple framework you can use for thinking about how am I not going to get these wrong for my system? And that's really the thing to take away. We'll go through an example for one particular requirement, one particular quality property, but you can do it for all of them. We just don't have time today. A much longer version of this talk does go through them all. Uh, and then just wrap up with a few final thoughts. So what is a production system? Um, any definitions? For me, a production system is any system where someone's doing real work in it, which means they care for two main things. If it's not there, they can't do their jobs. And if you lose the data in it, they get really upset. And that, for me, is production. It doesn't really matter how they're classified by an organization. Those, that's how you know a production system. And for many developers, I have noticed, and one of the reasons I give this talk, um, for those of you who know me, you'll know I've got these two hot buttons. One is productionization, and one is security. Because I find developers in general, we blame them a lot for developing insecure systems, and yet at no point do we try and communicate the essentials of how to create a secure system. And then people get beaten up for things that go wrong in production. And no one has ever um, actually taught developers what they need to do to deal with production. So when you were graduates, so most, many people here, I guess, read a technical degree at college. How many of you had a module on writing code for production? Yeah, I didn't either. And in your graduate training, you know, you came in and you were trained and you were mentored and you became a craftsman. During that process, how many of you had something formal about production? The constraints, the requirements, who you deal with? No, exactly. And then people beat you up when it went wrong in production. How unfair is that? So the problem is, who do you talk to? What's important? No one ever explains this stuff. You find it out by being called at three o'clock in the morning. And you know, it's worse than that because if production was really easy, you just figure it out. But production's a bit developer hostile generally, isn't it? And it's kind of for good reasons, because how do we treat the development environments? We just run rampant over them. We do anything we want to do. We install new stuff, we patch the operating systems, we use development languages that aren't ready for production. And obviously we can't do any of that in production. We've got to keep production clean, pure, and uh, completely stable. So it's kind of a difficult environment and no one teaches us about it. And in particular, there's a new cast of characters you've got to get used to. So who do you deal with in the dev environment? There's developers and there's users. And you know, there's different kinds of people involved in development. You know, there's people in, who specialize in tests. There are project managers. I'm sure you've got a senior manager. You've got a point, pointy haired boss. Some people will have, you just won't confess. Uh, but there's people involved in development. And then there's people who care what you're developing. And they tend to be real active end users who are involved and actually want to know what you're doing because they're going to suffer the system. And what happens when you go to production? Nothing, if, if my bill doesn't work. All these people come out of the woodwork. Where did all these people come from? You put a system in production and the world wants to know about it. Obviously, the IT operations group are very keen to know about it. Obviously, 
How many people here use a DevOps-oriented software development process? Oh, that's, go on, just bluff, put your hands up. You'll all feel much better about it. Um, so obviously with, with DevOps, ops will be involved right from the beginning, but they have a much, I have found that ops have a much sharper focus on the system when they're about to have to put it into production than three months beforehand when we're talking about generalities. So they become very interested. And then of course there's the inf infrastructure folks. You know when you wanted all that storage allocated and you couldn't get hold of them and they seem to be ignoring your tickets and they were rather elusive. They tend to find you, don't they, when your application has caused their infrastructure a problem. I mean, the, uh, the, the way that uh, I've observed many infrastructure people is that infrastructure architects believe that infrastructure would be fine if those people didn't keep installing applications on top of it and keep messing it up. So you've got to keep infrastructure happy. And then there's the senior managers, acquirers. These are the people paying for the system. So if you're in a really small firm, these might be external investors. There's who, whoever's money is being spent. And in a big firm, there's probably a budget holder, isn't there? He's a really senior business person who you've, you've heard of. He's never heard of you. But when your system goes wrong in production, suddenly he'd like to know who, what your name is. And not in a good way. Uh, I've noticed they're far keener to find out names in a bad way rather than to tell you what a stand-up job you did. It's just one of those unfair things in life. There's in the business managers. These are the folks actually running the business you're supporting. And there are you know, various levels, various specializations. But... When you were in development, did they get really involved? Were they there at the stand-ups going, I really want to drive this product for you. Let me explain all of, all of my constraints. Like hell they were. When it's in production, has just gone wrong and has just dropped all the transactions for the day on the floor, they tend to get much more involved very quickly. And then finally, you get a whole cast of characters I call auditors. They're the people with the checks and balances, security auditors, business auditors, compliance officers, all the folks who check you're doing the right thing, who again can be very hard to get their attention when you're in development and you're trying to work with them. But funnily enough, as soon as you're getting towards production, they suddenly get very, very interested very quickly. So a whole lot of people you need to keep, keep happy. And as we said, production is very constrained. It's highly controlled. It sort of has to be highly controlled because it's a very valuable thing. The, the content's all valuable. When, when, when your integration tests go wrong, what do you do? To get them running again. What's the first thing everyone tries to do? Reins well, reinstall the software in case you have a corruption. What do you do with the database? You just chuck all the data away, don't you? Whereas in production, people tend to have a really, really sh um, lack of tolerance for throwing all the data away. It might make the system work again. In fact, it was funny. Uh, one of the speakers in here earlier to get the demo working, he, uh, he, he, he truncated the database and rebuilt his app and it started working. Obviously, you can't do that in production. And finally, change can be difficult. I don't mean whether or not you've got a CD pipeline or whether all that's working smoothly. It's more the fact that you've got to think about change in production because it has an impact on a much bigger environment. If you're part of a large enterprise, how many of you work for an enterprise with, say, more than 20 major applications? Fair number? Of, yeah, oh, suddenly everyone starts counting and the hands go up. Yeah, so, I mean, there's potentially 20 touch points there. They're going to go wrong if you get your app wrong. So change has to be thought about rather more. It's also pretty unpredictable. How many of you have had an event happen in production that after, after you got it back together and you did the incident report, you thought to yourself, we would never have spotted that coming? I had one years and years ago where I was working on a system, called at 3 o'clock in the morning, system was going into mad garbage collection, discovered that one particular part of the process which had never caused a problem in five years of operation, which did an N by M match, which I accept was not the smartest bit of software engineering in the world, never caused a problem. What had happened was an upstream system had suddenly sent 160,000 of something in a single batch, where normally we got about 2,000 a month, and they'd send 160,000 in one go, and we tried to end by a match them, which clearly didn't end well. What had happened? It turns out that system had, a, had an end user programmable feature, which hadn't really been used before, where you could take a transaction, rewrite the transaction and replace the first transaction, all under end user control with a little kind of macro language. We didn't even know this existed. You can guess what, what happened next. Yeah, an end user didn't understand that if you created one and didn't remove the first one first, then the thing would go into a loop. And what had happened was it, the macro had just gone into a loop. So rather than generating one transaction for this special case, 160,000 of them completely flattened us. We would never have predicted that. We should have predicted that we could get overloaded, and I'll talk about that a bit later, but we would never have predicted that event. 
It's also highly visible. As I mentioned earlier, I found that when I was, when I was responsible for systems cold in the middle of the night, I got, or I got my name in front of some really senior business managers I barely heard of. They all got to know my name really quickly. Um, I've, I've been lucky enough to take over a few production systems that we described as red, meaning on the red, amber, green charts every morning. They had a very nasty habit of being bright red. And you really do get a lot of attention in those cases. But as I say, not in a good way. Everyone wants to know when you're going green. It's funny, when you're green, everyone forgets who you are because you're not causing them a problem. So it's completely different. And finally, you don't own production. Actually, irrespective of security control, this is a bit dramatic that you're not allowed near it. That's not the point. We genuinely don't own production. Who owns the development environment to the first approximation? Well, you do. Well, it's yours. You built it. You run it. It's for you. It's completely yours. Who owns production? The business that's paying your salary. It doesn't belong to IT. IT operate it on behalf of a business who own it. And so we've got to keep that at the back of our minds. Even if we have DevOps up and we've got completely automated pipelines and the whole thing looks very smooth, always bear in mind it's somebody else's environment. We are their custodians of it. We're not the owners of it. And that's a different philosophy. So what actually goes wrong in production? I bet you could all, you, you could all produce a list. Well, here's my list. First, set our performance surprises. Three things happen. I mean, this is the most classic stuff, I think, is that everyone thinks of production first. Uh, sorry, performance first. Um, interactive load surprises. Things like marketing uh, have put a lot of flyers in magazines, and they didn't think to tell technology first. All the magazines have gone out. And as soon as everyone picks them off the newsstand or they pick up their metro in the morning, they go to your website to type in their special code to get their bar of chocolate. If only they told you first. You could have checked that you had enough capacity for that. Very hard to, uh, um, to spot. Um, batch time surprises. You know, batches that run for 40 minutes, day in, day out, year in, year out. And then one day, they run for four hours, 22 minutes, and knock the entire batch schedule for the organization for six. Because I'm not a big fan of batch. I've always tried to design it out of my systems. But many enterprise environments, I mean, who here works for a medium-sized big company who doesn't have batch? You've all got it somewhere, right? Because even if you can pre-process your stuff event by event, if you can't get the data you need, which arrives in batches, you're going to have um, batch problems. And the last sort of surprise is, is are the system abusers. Um, there was a system not so long ago I worked on that um, one of the business analysts had a brilliant idea. We had quite a powerful system, um, relatively old-fashioned thick client, but very powerful thick client. End users loved it. But to search in the system, you had to know what kind of thing you were searching for. So you searched for an account, and it had a clever search function. And then you went to the client screen, you could do a clever cli you know, client search. And he said one day, you know, Google don't need to know what you're searching for. Why don't we give them a search box that just searches anything in the system that matches this string of text? That's a brilliant idea, we said. End users loved it, wasn't very difficult to do, went into production, everybody was happy. And then we were getting all these strange interactive performance problems in the afternoons. And we, we eventually tracked it down to one end user who clearly thought that this was mainly for entertainment, not for business purposes, and was asking it questions like, what have we done since 1972 for all clients in Botswana? And obviously that's quite a difficult thing for the system to answer quickly. So um, the, other, the other thing is where end users don't necessarily understand the impact that their use of a system can have on it. Now clearly, again, we should have done a smarter job about putting resource governance in. Again, touch on that a bit later. But system abusers can be quite hard to predict. The better the tool you give them, the more likely they'll find some way to abuse it. The only thing about production I touched on a few minutes ago is you're in an environment. What do you do in development and test? You mainly create a stable, isolated environment, don't you? Because you want to be sure what you're testing, and you want it to be predictable, because you don't want flickering tests. And that's exactly the opposite of production. You're now linked into this spider's web of an environment. And you can have a lot of problems with constraints and contention. I mean, contention, for example, on shared infrastructure. Has anyone here shared a SAN with a large system? That can be an unpleasant um, situation. Um, again, I was involved in a production incident where our database was suddenly running really, really slowly. So hence our batch was really, really slow and interactive suffered and the whole thing. And our DBAs were very, very puzzled because nobody changed anything until they called storage and went, these guys are seeing terrible, terrible performance on this SAN. And there was silence at the end of the phone. No, we haven't changed anything. Don't know what could be. Oh, oh, we just moved the data warehouse onto that SAN alongside you. Do you think that could have had an effect? 
Given they move half the data in the firm every night, that could have an effect, yes. Again, not something we could have controlled. Uh, unexpected behavior, such as when you, um, again, example years ago, we, we were calling a pricing service, and this pricing service evolved to be helpful and return a range of prices and not just one in our response without actually telling us. And they were, strictly speaking, correct, because they'd always returned a list, but they'd only ever returned one item in the list. And guess what our developer had done? Well, there'll only ever be one item in the list, so I'll take the first. We got some very, very strange pricing calculations for a couple of days till somebody figured it out. Uh, and the last point I keep seeing around, uh, around the environment is integration points. Wherever you're touching another system, you're dependent on somebody else doing their job well. Uh, this is something that somebody who works for a large bookseller that happens to also be a very important online company mentioned to me some time ago was that one of the real challenges he had in his environment was not so much keeping his service running, it was predicting what was going to happen to all the other services he was dependent on to deliver his service. So it's not just big banks of this problem. Failures, of course, happen. Software defects, they're completely our fault. So let's gloss over those and move on and just assume they never happen. Um, platform failures, platforms simply fail. They go wrong. And sometimes we have that all managed. Uh, sometimes we haven't done such a good job on that. Um, and then there's the environment failures. We're just something, it's not the underlying platform, but something is now malfunctioning in your environment. For example, something you call routinely via some synchronous connection, maybe not a good idea, but maybe you need to for some reason, suddenly starts running slowly, or suddenly starts returning you no values at all. There's a failure somewhere else. It's Peter Deutsch's definition of a distributed system, isn't it? It's when the failure of a computer you've never heard of prevents you getting any work done. It's that kind of environment problem. And lastly, security tangles. How does your security look in development? Everyone's pretty well got root, haven't they? Or some, some, some equivalent of root, because it doesn't really matter. And then you get to production, and what happens? You suddenly realize that it's an awful lot harder than you thought it was. Um, I've been involved in a number of situations where you actually shipped the software, having gone right through testing cycles and validation, and you got to production, and then you found the special guy who works in Hong Kong and mid-market risk or something, who needs a security profile that nobody else knew about. And it's just, just the problems with security is dealing with many security principles in different trees, different hierarchies, dealing with external security, all the stuff that really you can, do an all, you can go an awful long, long way down the security design route and actually manage to ignore most of this until you actually start thinking what the real environment is like. So given that gloomy outlook, what are we going to do about this? And how are we going to help engineers avoid these problems? I have noted over slightly too, too many years of uh, production systems experience, there's four things you always have to get right. And if you get any of these wrong, it ends badly. Now, every system has got unique requirements. Don't get me wrong. But this is not all you need to do. What I'm asserting, though, is if you're not functionally correct, and if you're not stable, and if you can't provide predictable capacity, and if you can't nail the security problem, you will have production problems. And I have uh, an awful lot of the real production incidents I've ever dealt with have had one of these problems behind, one of these root causes behind them. Um, and of course, there are many other ways you can go wrong in production. But these are kind of, kind of the cool ones. Um, and it's worth a couple of words on a few of them. Stability is really means predictability. It's not necessarily that you can do the impossible, but it's that when the impossible turns up, your system doesn't suddenly stop like the one I was talking about, unfortunately, did. And then capacity, it's being able to process whatever workload either is needed, but actually, in practice, it's you can process the workload you've promised to be able to pr process. A lot of critical banking systems, for example, do this. They agree what the capacity of the system is, and then they build the system in such a way that it will always process that capacity. However, if you send it more workload than that, it will get dropped on the floor, possibly silently. That's the contract, and that's the trade-off. They're guaranteeing a capacity. What they're not guaranteeing is to start doing their best once, you, once you've over that capacity. And it's a trade-off between whether you need more flexibility or the capacity is an absolute requirement. And then security kind of speaks for itself. People used to say there's no such thing as bad publicity, whereas if you've seen a few, a few security headlines in the last couple of years, that, that old adage probably no longer holds. There are definitely some kinds of uh, headlines you really don't want. So what have done... When I've dealt with this, when I've been designing systems and trying to um, help teams uh, move towards production, is that I found that you need to approach it at three different levels, which are really three different stages in your thinking. 
One is when you're putting your system together, you need to have strong design principles to make sure that people can achieve these four essential qualities just as a side effect of doing business as usual. So everyone follows a certain set of principles pretty well, they're going to be in line with, with these needs. Um, there are certain technological solutions, and as engineers that's often where we focus, because that's often the fun bit, is figuring out what the right design pattern is, or what kind of security algorithm we're going to use. And finally, especially when we're dealing with operations groups, it's really important to be clear what kind of processes we're going to use. That doesn't mean a big thick binder full of paper that gives people step-by-step -step instructions, unless that's what someone's asked for. But it is being clear how you're going to do certain things with your production system so that you don't need to work it out the first time when something goes wrong. This is a really common problem with security. What's one of the processes that you always need for enterprise security? What happens when things go wrong? You'll need an incident response plan. Agreed? The thing that a certain large international entertainment company clearly did not have when they they were attacked badly a couple of years ago. Or if they had it, they didn't know how to use it. Um, it's not necessarily that you want a binder full of material, but you do need a group of people who have agreed who's involved, who's doing what, and what they're going to do. You don't want to work out your incident response plan on your feet in the glare of the world's media, or even in the glare of your CEO's unhappy stare. So the kind of things that fit in here are things like, you might have a design principle to stress simplicity to help you achieve correctness. That's a rather trivial one, I know, but there are definitely design principles can drive you towards correctness, functional correctness. You might, for example, remember under stability, we were talking about resource governors, a very a specific technical solution. You might decide that you are going to use resource governors in certain places in order to achieve um, stability. And for processes, for example, for security, you might decide you are going to get people to do threat modeling because you know that has beneficial side effects in understanding the threats and working out what the correct mitigations are. Or similarly, you might have, as I said, incident response plans, or there are a number of processes relevant to them. The key thing is, this is a framework where you simply put this up on the whiteboard, and you go, right, to achieve these four, which of these areas are relevant, and what are we going to do in each? And you need to agree that as a team. And I'm not suggesting mad amounts of big upfront design, where you start sketching loads of UML diagrams to figure out how you're going to build stability mechanisms into your system. But I am suggesting that before, you get, before you've invested very much of that business's money, you do need to understand how you are going to achieve these four critical properties. A few general principles which are going to help you is thinking about one team early on. You all work for DevOps organizations. It's all right, put your hands up. We won't tell anyone. Um, making sure that, do you remember that big cast of characters? making sure that everyone in that is feeling a bit of accountability, but also feeling fully consulted that they know what's going to happen about the system when it gets towards production. Auditors in particular, in my experience, particularly don't like surprises. They're what I term as often a negative stakeholder. The best result for an auditor is your, 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 your project gets cancelled and your system never gets near production, because then they don't need to worry about it. And obviously, that's not what the business wants, but they're, they're quite a negative um, stakeholder. Having them as part of a one team early is a great thing. Automating everything we can, I think that's becoming more and more a well-understood principle. The more we automate, the less um, surprises we're going to have, and the better we'll, we'll get at doing it. Measuring and improving as we go, so that we actually know if we're getting better or worse, and if we're getting worse, we can do something about it. And finally, is making sure that we do this in a timely manner. We're going to need good enough, and especially around processes, we can often agonize to the point where we're trying to write micro-level fine-grained processes. And if you've dealt with an operations team who've come from maybe a heavyweight mainframe background, they may, may be very comfortable producing very, very detailed processes. It's worth challenging that and asking them what the value of such a detailed process, assuming they've got skilled staff is. That's just one example where you would make that trade-off. But often it's, it's being good enough. It's learning, learning lessons from the Facebooks and the... Googles and the Netflix that you need to be good enough to go to production because you don't know what perfection looks like anyway. So you need to get to production to get the feedback loop to figure out what direction you should be heading in. These things today, of course, the CD and DevOps movement are talking about, they're not new though. CD and DevOps are labeling them as important things and that's terrific, but they've been around a long time. 
we just need a bit of focus on them. So to give you an example, how would you go about using this framework? Supposing you want to achieve stability. I had to pick one of them because the full presentation does all four, but I, I've picked stability today. Mainly because it's got a nice diagram, but see what you think when we get there. So, for example, suppose you, you, you need to achieve stability. What design principles are you going to use with your developers so that people understand how to achieve stability in your system? Well, for example, three high-level principles might be failing quickly, isolating problems, and making sure that you always can maintain steady-state operation. They sound sort of obvious, don't they? How many systems have you worked on that you've had a problem in one part of it has managed to ripple right across the system and paralyze the whole thing? That's a really, really common problem, especially in connected enterprise systems. And a problem in one system causes them all to come to their knees. Um, once the classic service in an enterprise will bring it to its knees, which service would you turn off to bring the enterprise to its knees the fastest? It's a network service. LDAP's a good one, actually. I was thinking even more fundamentally DNS. Turn off DNS, nothing will work. A difficult one to isolate, I must admit. But failing quickly, so you fail fast, you don't keep retrying things, especially under machine control, and you time out so that if things are going wrong, you find out quickly. You don't have all your threads hung up waiting for something that's never going to return. If you're going to isolate problems, can you put circuit breakers into your API calls so that you don't overwhelm the, um, the remote systems with more and more calls when they clearly can't respond? Can you put bulkheads in your system? This is a Mike Nygaard term. So it's, is there a way of isolating your system such that a memory overload condition in one, part of, well, in one service will not affect another service? Um, and can you um, integrate asynchronously? so everything doesn't get hung up in a huge distributed call chain when something goes wrong. And ensuring steady state operation is really boring, but actually it's quite common that if, if you're in a big organization and you look down a list of production incidents over a week, it's not rare at all to find one or two systems that have had an incident because they, they forgot about the boring stuff of steady state operation, truncating their logs, making sure they had a storage management policy, predicting memory usage uh, on a rolling basis, understanding what their bandwidth requirement was, and so on. So suppose then you had actually identified some design principles. Clearly, you need to communicate those clearly and agree them as a team. And then those, it's not about giving people micromanagement, but it does help them to think about prioritization and think about their software being production ready much earlier in the process than we often encourage people to do so. So then, you then need to actually look at some technology solutions in nearly all cases. I mean, some of the examples would be things like failing fast so that you, your load balances have got, uh, are, are very intolerant to problems going on further down the stack and very quickly start returning errors to people. Because if you do REST-based APIs, this is, a, this is a terrific heuristic. If you've got a problem further down and things are running slowly, just send people retry failure codes because there's no point in trying to process them if your system's already becoming overloaded. Separating your system into separate physical parts can be a good way to I implement these, these sort of virtual bulkheads so that one overloaded server doesn't cause the entire estate to, um, to get overloaded. If you're calling things that can unpredictably take a long time, make sure you've got timeouts. How I many of you have got a short timeout on your database tier? Yeah, it's a few nods, which is good actually. Because very, very uh, um, commonly, um, when you've seen a problem around the database, you find that one of the things that really knocked the problem on and caused problems was that all the client software, which is normally sitting in the mid-tier, all sent their queries and then waited infinitely, or waited so long it might as well be infinite. And so they stacked lots of work up in the database that was clearly had a problem with it, and then tied up all of the middle tier, which then tied up all of the mid-tier, which tied up all of the front, etc., etc. So um, timing out fast, you can propagate a problem back and handle it and get that work out of the system because it, it's, it's probably not, not going to complete anyway. A resource governor, that's one of the ways you prevent databases running away, but many technologies that are resource intensive have got resource governors in them. And a circuit breaker, which I'll just talk about in a moment, but that's a way of wrapping an API that you feel may fail at some point or is, li is, is likely to have some failure. So 
a circuit breaker, again, I'm stealing, stealing shamelessly from Mike Nygaard here, um, but it's a common pattern that in fact, back when I worked in the system software industry, it's very, very common that system software products do this. I've seen it very, very rarely in application software. The idea is that you put a very simple state-based wrapper around any synchronous uh, invocations you need across networks. Now, we could agree that synchronous invocations are not ideal, but you often need them. So what's going to happen if the thing at the far end starts to come under very heavy load and starts taking a very long time to return to your synchronous RPC? What's going to happen to your system? It's slowly going to grind to a halt, isn't it? Because you'll get more and more threads all hung up waiting for the network service. What do you think is happening at the far end? It started running slowly, and to help them out, what did you do? You sent them a lot more work. They, they probably didn't thank you for that, because you're really not helping. So that's what circuit breakers are, that's the situation circuit breakers are meant to help with. In the normal condition, you call the circuit breaker, it calls the service, returns, you're done. If, however, it hits a problem, if there's an error, it starts, or it times out, or whatever, it starts counting that event. And if it goes over a certain threshold, it stops trying to propagate to the remote service. It just starts throwing errors. As soon as you call it, it'll throw an error straight back to you, which is just what you need, because it stops your thread being hung up. So you might sacrifice five of your threads, which are now hung up, and they might have five requests to deal with, but it's an awful lot better than 500. Whereas 495 of yours have now been errored out quickly, and you can get that workload out of the system and tell them all to retry, and they'll back off. Um, obviously, then, it's, um, you, you, there, there are variations on it. Either after a, a timeout period, it can reset itself, or you can decide, actually, say you were dealing with a credit card processing company. They don't fail very often. When they do, it can be catastrophic. You might want a human being. There might be an ops procedure at that point to raise an alert and manually, re, manually reset the circuit breakers. That's really a detail. The key point is, when something's going wrong, don't make it worse. And then when you, once you've got technology, you probably want to start thinking about what processes are you going to use to help the stability of the system? The principles, really, around processes for stability, I think, would be you want repeatability. The more times you do something, the more likely you are to do it well, and the more likely you are to do it in a consistent way. Automation is the colliery of that. If you automate something, the computer's going to do it the same way every time. So you're going to, providing it's reliable, end up with a very stable process that works the same way every time. And you need transparency so you can tell when things start to go wrong. One of the other problems I've seen very regularly with enterprise systems is that you find out things have gone wrong quite late in the day. What's your, what's your monitoring system for production? How do you find out your system is running slowly? Is it a well-defined alert with a rising threshold and a graph, or is it an end user calling a help desk? Because it's quite often, let's be honest, it's an end user calling a help desk going, this system's a bit slow this morning. And everyone looks in and goes, yes, that's right. It's not exceeded any thresholds, but it is really rather slow. Um, modern tools, I mean, um, people like AppDynamics and their friends, uh, competitors who I know, New Relic, um, are examples of tools that are very good at tracking what's happening in an estate and showing you trends, smoothing out the noise and allowing you to see dangerous trends early. But there are lots of other ways of doing it. Um, the important thing is, is allowing people to see what's going on in a way that doesn't swamp them with information. Because that's the other thing, is that we log everything, right? And what happens when you have to debug something? You can't find anything, because there's logs everywhere. And you don't really know what logs to look in. It's very difficult to find them. So it's transparency rather than data production. And so process automation is absolutely, in my view, crucial to achieving stability. The kind of conceptual model being that you've got a human being maybe triggering but certainly can oversee an automated process which is pushing changes into your estate. So everything's got an API, which is just changes the game entirely when everything can be automated. Everything in the estate that's working automatically is reporting what it's doing, and you're pushing all that into a monitoring system that knows what normal looks like. And then the human being can ask questions such as, has this completed? What has completed in the last hour? How many of these changes have we done? But most importantly, the monitoring system knows to recognize abnormal and can propagate that to the human being who can then decide to change something that the monitor is doing. That's the fundamental structure of 
creating successful process automation, in my view. So in summary, production's different. Production's not like our dev, test, integration type environments. It's quite demanding because you need correctness, you need stability, you need capacity, and you need to be secure in a predictable way. And unless you've got those, I predict you will have production problems, irrespective of what your enterprise architecture team or your end users or those nice external consultants from the management consultancy told you your requirements were. If those four things aren't there, bad things will happen. And so the question is, how on earth do we guide potentially quite a big development team with people from many different backgrounds, lots of different kinds of skills, to actually achieve those four? Well, my suggestion is, what we need to do is to make sure we've got design principles that support them. We make clear technology decisions, especially if we can, pushing those into infrastructure and frameworks. And we think as early as possible about process constraints. What processes will we need at some point before we get to production? And we do that for, to support each of those qualities explicitly. And that's all part of, if you like, the spike that starts the project. I'm not suggesting that's a huge design exercise. What it is, is a focused thinking exercise. And it guides you into the problems you're going to have to solve before you get to production. And it prevents them all becoming a huge surprise just before you get to production, which is what I've seen many teams, has happened with many teams. They've done a great job in development, but because they've not actually been thinking about the production environment, there's a lot of very unpleasant surprises very close to production. These requirements and principles are not new. I am old enough just to have, to have worked on mainframes. My, uh, I was sponsored by Ford Motor Company, and uh, I spent a short period on the mainframe before moving on to what Ford thought were newfangled and, frankly, rather untrustworthy distributed systems based on Unix. It took them a long time to come around to it. What was really interesting, though, is that seeing the DevOps movement is just fantastic because they're saying all the right things and doing all the right things. What's really interesting for those of us, those of us with, with grey hair is how much many of the mainframe people have been saying the same things in the background for some time. The big difference is what the mainframe people haven't been saying, haven't been stressing, is integrating the teams, and they haven't been stressing automation from development into production. In fact, they rather like a bit of an air gap. They like stuff handed over, and that's what we've got to change, and that's what DevOps and CD have been doing so well. Dave Farley was talking on that earlier. So it's all about breaking down silos to allow the old principles, which are timeless, to actually become effective in, in today's much more dynamic environments. In 40 minutes, I'm not going to actually teach you very much about production, but there are, in fact, a small number of books. And that's the other funny thing. Go to Amazon and do some counts on programming books. Just do searches and look at the counts. Java, you know, XML, God help us. JSON, REST, loads and loads of topics, thousands of books, certainly hundreds in many cases. Go and try and find books on operations, production, migration to operations, path to production, and don't use the term DevOps. How many books will you find? Not very many. Um, a few of the ones that I think are well worth looking at, which are, I've explicitly not included all the DevOps books. It's not to say they're not very good, but I'm looking for slightly more fundamental ones. Mike Nygaard's book, Release It, is really excellent. A few years old now. A few of his technology war stories now aren't quite so relevant in that you won't see the problem. But crikey, the way he handles it, the way he spots it, and the way he resolves it is exactly what you do with a different problem. Full of... Um, it's really interesting because he, he was very much pioneering development meets ops guy at the, at the dawn of the large-scale web. And his book is packed full of anecdotes about Black Friday disasters and uh, scalability nightmares and um, middleware collapsing and bugs you would never have uh, thought about that all had to be worked around in production. And he, he's got great advice on what to do. In fact, I've stolen shamelessly from some of his concepts. What to do well before you get there to ensure that all the problems he's had don't happen to you. Uh, web Operations is a nice book. It's a series of essays, really, on different uh, web ops-based topics. It's written by all the really big guys in the industry. It's written, there's a chapter from Facebook, there's a chapter from eBay. I suspect there was a chapter from Netflix, I don't remember, but I'm, uh, I think there probably was, uh, and all of the other guys like that. And they're really interesting because they deal at a scale that most of us will never have to. So to see the way that they deal with the problem allows us to see what the ultimate good looks like, and then scale it down for our own environments. There's lots of experience there. Um, and Design Build Run by 
Dave Ingram. I just remembered his name at the last minute. Uh, Dave is Accenture, I think, or ex Accenture, um, has done a lot of work working at the data center end of things and also has a very good understanding of software development. If you're dealing with production people from a fairly traditional background, this is a great book to help bridge the gap culturally. There's a lot in it that they'll understand and like, but you'll end up in much the same place as if you start from a much more modern DevOps approach. And it can really help to build a few bridges. And finally, there's the book Nick Rosansky and I wrote. Uh, when you're doing your architecture, one of the views that we have is the operational view, which is quite rare in uh, architecture thinking. It's quite rare that architecture stuff has much about production. But the operations view is, as we put it, how you get your system to, to production and keep it there, which is where the title of this came from. So I am just about on time. So happy to take questions and or discussions are even better than questions, actually. Uh, and can you rate the session for the second time? Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so the question is, how do you prioritize this? And I guess that's why I go around giving this talk so much. I give it within Indava. Every time I visit a delivery unit, I give this talk. Um, uh, well, one of the things is we talk to them, and we do give them talks that hopefully um, a longer version of this has more funny stories. I'm really sorry you couldn't have the funny stories. I only had 40 minutes. Um, so we go and talk to them. That's actually the key thing. But I think what's really important is that two things. One, really senior management in technology and the business make it clear to people that Production failures are not acceptable, but in a good way. They'll support them in doing the right thing. And actually, you've got to get senior managers to behave, and, to behave as if they believe that. And that's not always straightforward. Um, and the second thing is to make sure that one team concept. If you get people from all these different stakeholder groups involved in some kind of virtual team, developers get much more interested because actually people are interested in them. And they're asking them, how are you going to do this? And they say, well, we don't know. How are you going to help us? And suddenly the profile of it raises and people start putting stories on backlogs that say, I've just been talking to somebody from compliance. I didn't even know we had compliance. And apparently, and you know, up goes the story. And that can really help because people talk to people. Yes? Hi, um, I was just wondering whether, uh, what, like, what you exactly mean by correctness. Um, mm -hmm. Because it seems like some of the other categories also kind of come under that banner. I mean strictly functional correctness. And I skip over that even in the full version of this very neatly. What I'm really talking is, what I'm really talking about is, um, have you got sort of behavior-driven development front to back? Can you really stand up and say, I've got an executable spec, and I can prove the code does what the spec says? There is then another question, which is, did you have the right spec? And then there's a the whole sort of um, Goico's kind of questions about how did the business produce the spec for you? So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about under functional correctness. You're quite right. Correctness itself is too general. Okay, thanks very much. I think it's beer and keynote. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But one thing.